All set. This meeting of the Transportation and Public Safety Committee of Community Board 2 is called to order and recording may begin. The meeting is now being recorded for the purpose of transparency and for permanent pub public access on the CB2 YouTube archive. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. District staff will actively assist in maintaining this protocol. It is the practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members' cameras on for full transparency. We encourage all attendees to also leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. To maintain appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, then board members at large, and then the general public. If you wish to speak, please use the WebEx feature in the participants panel to digitally raise and your, lower your hand, and I will call you in order. If you have questions that fall outside the public comment time, please put your questions in the chat panel and we will address them if relevant to the matter and if time permits. If any attendee experiences technical difficulties with the WebEx software or features during the meeting, you can consult help.webex.com or after the meeting, you can reach out to the district office. It is our desire to provide access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. So if you require accommodation or assistance, please call the district staff 72 hours before any public meeting. Um, have, did we have any accommodations today? Okay. There, now we will begin roll call. And uh, John, if you could um, go through the list. Chair, Chair, Juliet Cullen Chung. Yes. Present. Vice Chair Cheryl Gelbs. Present. John. There's Cheryl, thank you. Uh, John Quint, present. Ernest Augustus. Sandy Balboza. Present. Doreen Gallo. I'm sorry, John Du, next. Doreen Alpha. Yes, here. Doreen Gallo. She said she'll join late. What was that, Julia? Doreen said she'd be late. Okay. Uh, Brian Howell. Patrick Kalaki. He'll be late as well. No, I'm, I'm actually here. Oh, He's on. Sorry, I saw him on. I'm here uh, with bad connections, so no, no video. That's right. We hear you, Cam Patrick. Sid Meyer. Brown. Ciro Scala. He said he'd be late. And Caroline, Todd, are you on? She sent an email. She just put it in the chat box that she was having trouble. Caroline, are you on? I am here, yes. Okay. We have a quorum. Thank you, John. So I will have a, is there a motion to approve the agenda for tonight? So moved. Hey, John. And Sid second, thank you. Um, the first presentation is by Captain Adil Rana, the new commanding officer of the 84th Precinct. Are you on, Captain? Is there anyone from the 84th Precinct uh, present? Carol Ann, um, do you want to, do you have the contact information for Captain Rana? I made that error, didn't I? Rob has his contact info, his direct contact info, Rob. Can you find out, please? Thank you. I imagine the Brooklyn Bridge Forest presentation is going to take some 30 minutes, so I would rather give Captain Rana the opportunity if he's going to be joining within the next minute or two. Um, in the meantime, while we prepare for him, um, I would be happy to share the um, crime statistics, the CompStat reports, a little bit out of order, but in preparation for Captain Rana's joining of the meeting. Um, is it possible for me to um, share my WebEx?
if, if that's Othea as host, I'm not sure. Hi, Julia, you have presenter privileges. Go ahead. OK, thanks. All right. Can everybody see this? Yep. OK, this is the 84th Precinct Comstat report uh, for the week and the month. And we review this every month, usually during the chair's report session, but uh, this time we'll review it um, while we're waiting for Captain Rana. Um, I just wanted to note a couple things. Interestingly, it looked like grand larceny and petty larceny are down. And I wonder if Captain Rana might be able to speak about the fact that, that those two items may be down, maybe just because people are not going out as much as they used to be. Um, and as we have spoken in previous months, the um, uh, shooting incidents and shooting victims are up um, in, the, in both 84th and 88th precincts, although the murder rate is uh, the same as last year. Now going to the 88th precinct, the numbers are quite a bit higher, six murders instead of one this year, and 19 shooting victims, 14 shooting incidents, which is, you know, a, about the same percentage jump as the 84th, but quite a bit more in the 88th than the 84th. Juliet, if I could share, um, in the 88th, yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes go ahead, John. Uh, one of those shootings of three teenagers occurred on Myrtle Avenue wow. within the Business Improvement District. And um, as of my checking today, we don't have uh, that that particular crime has been solved. It was an evening at about 10 or 1030. And one of the teenagers is part of the Myrtle Avenue food delivery program. We sponsor uh, food deliveries for folks in the public housing projects. And he was uh, one of the teenagers. I was told he was 16 or 17 years old. Wow. That's very sad. Thank you for sharing, John. Juliet? Yes. Hi. So um, on Atlantic Avenue, um, I think it was last week, there was a robbery at gunpoint at the Times Plaza post office. Um, and the person uh, at gunpoint took, took uh, wallets from the customers there. And we haven't been able to get information on it. So if, if we could get something tonight, that would be good from, from the captain. Sounds good. It could Juliet, be that I, I spoke I, too soon about no emergencies um, coming up too. <laughs> um, I should also add that the precincts are being asked to assign some of their officers routinely to pop to Barclays because of all of the um, gatherings that occur there and then the marches that occur afterwards. So in a recent meeting with the 88th Precinct Council, the captain did report that while he is at full staff, he doesn't always have his full staff to deploy routinely because some of the officers are assigned to Barclays. Okay. Um, I would like to stop sharing my screen now and then we can go back. Um, Rob, did were you able to get in contact with Captain Rana or the 84th? We can't we can't hear you, Rob, if you're speaking. Yeah, as I as I posted in the chat panel, Captain Rana had to respond to a call and he hopes to have that wrapped up in 10 minutes. Okay. So um then we'll proceed to the presentation. Um is uh Scott Francisco present? Yes, I'm here representing okay. our team. Hi, Hi there. We'd love to hear about uh, Brooklyn Bridge Forest. 
And if you'd like to take control of the screen to do a presentation. Sure, I'd love to. So let's see, share content. Um, just let me know if uh, this is coming through. We see it. Great. Um, well, I want just before we get started, first of all, thank you so much for having us. And I think there's there's three or four others of our team um, in, in the room here with us. Um, I'll do the majority of the presenting, but um, we were thinking it was going to take longer than this, so I'm just wondering: will the will the captain come towards the end of the meeting, or should we take a pause, which would be fine, by the way, for for us if we wanted to do it that way? How long do you think your presentation would take? Um, I'm hoping to go through the slides in about 10, 10 minutes or so, and then, but I think there'll be lots of discussion. That's what we're hoping for. So, I would hope so. Um, Rob, do you think that we could uh, push the captain to six forty five? Um, you know what, when it seems like you're wrapping up, I will, um, I will let him know that we're ready for him. Okay, let's see if he joins. We'll play by ear. Great. Thanks. Scott. Great. Yeah, and I'm happy to be interrupted and, and take a break. Um, so, so, well, first of all, um, thanks again for having us. And uh, this is a, this is a presentation that comes from about 10 years of work on a project called the Brooklyn Bridge Forest. Uh, we were thrilled when we heard about the competition that uh, the New York City Council launched at the beginning of the year, along with Van Allen Institute, and our team rallied to put together an entry for the Reimagining Brooklyn Bridge competition, uh, which we were delighted to be the winners of announced um, in early August. So um, we're going to present that story with an emphasis on um, our immediate actions that we would like to support the city in moving forward on the Brooklyn Bridge um, challenge of pedestrian and cyclist congestion on the bridge, as well as some of the public space surrounding the bridge. Um, so our project is really about the, the bridge as a, a centerpiece of the city and also a potential icon of global sustainability that connects the uh, history of the bridge and the use of wood on the bridge to forest conservation uh, at a global level, and also in, in, the, in New York City uh, in terms of public space and um, micro forests around the bridge. Um, this is all really centered on the promenade and um, what we're going to go back and forth through some of the solutions about the, um, the, the bike lanes in particular and, and our ideas for the promenade space. Um, our team is a really diverse group of people, some of whom are here with us tonight. Um, most of us either live in New York or have lived in New York, um, but we've spent time around the world um, working on some of these issues and so we're just we see this as an opportunity to bring um, some of that thinking right into the heart of New York City um, and use the bridge as a place for experimentation and, um, and action on these issues. Um, the, the, comp the, the presentation or the, the concept of the Brooklyn Bridge Forest is based on really uh, three main concepts. One is public engagement and, and making decisions for the bridge uh, by engaging communities um, um, part of what we're doing here tonight. Um, we have a proposal to get bike lanes implemented on the bridge immediately. Um, that was part of our proposal that we could start very quickly with a pilot. We're going to talk about that mostly tonight. And then the other is, is the sustainable sourcing of the wooden planks for the promenade long term from a partner forest um, in the tropics. Um, Many of you may have, or some of you may have seen the presentation, so I'm not going to go into the, the entire history of our proposal. I think that I've given you sort of the broad brush strokes. Um, we have this phase zero, which is really what can be done immediately on the bridge to uh, solve some of the congestion problems. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, what it's like to walk or cycle over the promenade and the Brooklyn Bridge. And, um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a bit of a nightmare over the last few years as that traffic has ramped up. And of course, with COVID and all those transformations, it's a whole different set of, of issues. Our phase zero um, approach that we, we built into our proposal was to, in basically in the first year, um, get a new bike lane implemented on the traffic deck, we call it the lower deck of the Brooklyn Bridge, along with a series of, of public space interventions that would come, um, come along with that. Um, when we did this presentation, we had we created three timelines because the bridge is such a, a historic structure. You have to think of it in long term history as well as, you know, medium term and then and the short term. 
is is really over the next few years. And we put together this phase zero approach, which is again, what can be done uh, right away? And um, we're talking about reevaluating the needs. Um, DOT has expressed those needs. I know this group has already um, commented on uh, the urgency of, of improving the flow of pedestrians and cyclists over the bridge. Um, so we're moving through this process and I, I should note that we've had a meeting with Manhattan Community Board 1, wherein they passed a positive resolution in favor of, of working with this proposal. Um, so uh, breaking this down, we've got a proposal for a, a public space bike ramp in the Brooklyn Anchorage Plaza, which we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, similarly, on the Manhattan side, um, resuscitating a, uh, an underutilized or unused um, ramp from the Brooklyn Bridge that is currently uh, being used by NYPD for parking uh, post 9-11, and then creating some, some green spaces to support those uh, areas on both sides of the bridge that connect uh, a new bike lane uh, on the Manhattan bound, i.e. north side of the bridge on the outer lane. And um, along with this comes a series of programming ideas like working with youth, um, creating some spaces in the anchorage for, for young people to engage with this, both even in the process of the planning and, and rollout, um, and also ongoing education um, and, and engagement with young people. So just to get really sort of simple and practical, um, our, our phase zero proposal is to implement a bike lane, a two-way bike lane on the outer lane of the um, Manhattan bound section of the bridge. So if you see this red circle here, this is really the, the heart of the phase zero proposal, uh, which is a, a quick, an inexpensive deployment of this bike lane. Um, you see on the top level, we have some grander plans for the reconstruction of the promenade that really respect the history of the bridge um, using wood as it always has been um, and actually creating long-term an additional bike two-way bike lane that is a slight expansion of the promenade on the upper deck, along with some what we call lookout spaces, uh, which allow for some expansion of the pedestrian area. So that's part of the long-term plan, but our focus right now is to work with DOT, um, the community boards, and all of the stakeholders um, to get bike traffic moving on the bridge as quickly as possible. And on the right hand of the screen, you'll see under the other red circle, a proposal to have a, an additional lane potentially for electric assist vehicles, which we know is a big theme right now in, in the city. So just looking at the cross section of the bridge, um, the upper deck is where the promenade has always been historically and the lower deck for a variety of different traffic uses over the years. And what we're proposing is to take a single lane. Oops. Is everyone able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, a single lane of car traffic um, to dedicate for the first two-way bike lane on the north side. And again, potentially on the, um, on the Brooklyn bound side an electric assist lane. Um, many people have confronted the fact that there's a question about the loading of the bridge, and, and we recognize that um, this first proposal of using the lower deck for the for the um, bike lane does not substantially increase the load in the bridge. Um, one of our team members who's actually present with us tonight is part of the Silman um, Engineering uh, Company, which is one of New York's um, uh, prestigious engineering firms and has done a preliminary load calculation. So what we're proposing tonight is something that is, is doable within the load limits of the bridge from our preliminary uh, research on this. Just to put it in overall perspective, this is a collapse view. We're talking about the green line being the, the bike lane that goes from between Brooklyn and Manhattan using these two new ramps. I'm gonna zoom, on, zoom in on this in a second. And the yellow dat dashed line would be the electric assist uh, lane, which would start at um, center and go all the way to uh, Tillery Street. But let's just zoom in for a minute on the, the two approaches to this bike lane, the Manhattan uh, ramp on the top and the Brooklyn ramp on the bottom. And our proposal is to create really kind of cool and exciting public spaces that also form the entrance and exits to this new bike lane. And this is what allows the, the bike lane to be on the outer lane of the northbound section uh, because getting on and off the bridge is one of the biggest challenges for using that lower deck. So we've come up with some innovative solutions on both sides and we'll uh, zoom in on that a little bit further. So some of you are probably quite familiar with this um, triangular um, space, which is currently a kind of staging loading um, underutilized area right now. Um, 
some trucks and, and equipment parked in it. Uh, we're proposing a spiral ramp that is made of scaffolding. It's a temporary pop-up structure that would be low cost, quick and easy to deploy that would get hikes on this um, on this lower deck of the bridge very quickly. And within this, we would have um, one of our microforest concepts that's part of our overall project uh, with public spaces for gathering, um, social distance gathering, as well as um, a variety of vendor spaces using the, the um, uh, the approach vaults, not necessarily penetrating the stone, um, the stone wall recess, but just using the recess portion, which is about three feet deep, and, and tucking some temporary vendor space in there. Um, from the ground level view, this is sort of what it would look like, um, and this ramp again, starting, starting, um, connecting to some of the bike lanes coming down off Cadman Plaza, allows cyclists to ride up onto the, the deck of the bridge. More technical drawings here. Um, and we have, you know, really, really nice plans for the um, ecological uh, and biodiversity aspect of the space and um, leaning on the work of um, Wildlife Conservation Society and Eric Sanderson from the Manahata Project, bringing back some of the biodiversity uh, from this area and making that part of the public space while supporting the cycling infrastructure. Uh, just to go over to the Manhattan side. Briefly, um, some of you may be aware that there is a ramp, the ramp that used to go to, maybe you remember using it to Park Row, which has been blocked off since 9-11 um, and used by NYPD, our proposal uh, for parking currently, so no access to cars right now or trucks. Uh, we're proposing to resuscitate that and use that as the on and off ramp on the Manhattan side. It's a very wide ramp, it's 24 feet wide, which means that not only a bike lane can be placed there, but it can be created, it can be turned into a kind of plaza space for um, cycling infrastructure like a city bike dock, uh, a small cafe, um, and other amenities for cyclists to use and really celebrate um, this low carbon transportation. Here's, a, here's zooming in on the aerial view of that. You can see the bike lane um, with plenty of space left over for other uh, cycling related infrastructure on that ramp. Um, here's what it would look like from the um, High level view from the promenade. So this Jersey barrier, which currently is blocking the ramp off, would be shifted over and um, giving cyclists full access. And here is looking up that ramp with um, the idea of a pop-up cafe for bike bicycles and cyclists coming up from the Manhattan side. Um, and again, here's the current this is the current situation. NYPD using it for parking, and our proposal was to turn this into the on ramp for the bridge. So really that's the core of our bike lane proposal um, that was part of our winning competition entry. Um, backing this up is this idea of microforest, and we wanna interweave this into our project wherever we can, which is uh, these small biodiverse forest clusters that um, have proven that they can be done in cities and done well and bring back um, biodiversity and plant life and create welcoming spaces for, uh, for people um, in the heart of the city. And so, uh, we have a few ideas of where these would be deployed on both the Brooklyn and the Manhattan side. Um, in Manhattan, adjacent to the approaches, we've got a few areas that, uh, including at the Smith Houses, NYCHA Smith Houses, as well as adjacent to um, uh, these, these vaults that we're hoping to resuscitate in longer term. And just quickly, the idea of a, of a space for young people making a really cool, engaging clubhouse kind of space that would take this approach vault, sorry, this is the Anchorage vault, and turn it into uh, a welcoming space. This is right adjacent to the NYCHA housing, and we think a really awesome place for young people to get together, um, learn about uh, science, history, technology, and um, engaging issues that um, local mentors from New York can uh, work with these kids on, hopefully including us. Um, maybe just one more thing about public engagement. Um, we were the one finalist entry that really um, saw the decision making process in terms of traffic and dedication of different uh, traffic uh, and transportation types of something that needed to be done through community engagement. And this sketch is just to show that we still intend to work through that. And we know that the, the removal of a car lane, a traffic lane is something that can be contentious. Um, and so within the competition, we were the we were the entry that really held back and said we want to make sure that this is done in consultation, um, so that folks, you know, as many people 
hundreds of thousands of people that drive cars across the Brooklyn Bridge. We recognize that, but we also recognize that um, the changing dynamics of transportation and energy are really forcing us to look at these issues. And we see the Brooklyn Bridge as a great place to, to sort of play that out um, with the right engagement of, uh, of stakeholders. So and maybe I'm just going to stop there. I'm sure there are lots of questions and there's, there's much more to talk about, but take a deep breath um, and we can start the conversation. And I can show more images um, as they become uh, useful to answer questions. Thank you, Scott. It is a very creative, fresh, and hopefully viable proposal. Um, uh, as you know, our community board supports the um, uh, change of one of the roadway beds to a bike lane um, in the near term. And it's nice that, that uh, your proposal has that um, mm -hmm. and so much more. So I'd like to open up the questions um, to committee members first, please. Actually, Juliet, if I may, I, re I realize there's one important thing I forgot to say, which might be a question, um, and that is, how does this get paid for? Um, I should say that our proposal is based on a zero cost solution to the city. So um, we're basing this this phase of our proposal on uh, external funding um, so that uh, the city would not have to pay anything for this. And we have received interest from sponsors for the project. Um, Nothing, of course, uh, firmed up yet, but that's our intention. I should just even say better. that. Even better. Great. Thanks. So, so I just need to clarify sponsors do not mean bridge tolls to any extent, does it? No, no, this would be um, essentially corporate underwriting of the project and our budget for the for the phase zero components that I've shown is about is is quite low and it's 2.5 million and that's for the 2 ramp conversion spaces and the. The connecting bike lane, and we've purposely designed it to be very uh, modest in its origin, its initial scope, so that it could be done quickly and affordably. John, do you have further questions? Oh, sure. Um, at some point, there were trains that rode over the Brooklyn Bridge. Is that space that the trains occupied uh, vacant, or has it been occupied, taken up? By some other service over the bridge. Who takes the runway, the runway in the 1950s? Yeah, I don't know how visible this this slide is, but you can see the historic um, transformation of the bridge from when it was first built in 1883, where you had horses and carriages, and then the trains came on in the in the, around the turn of the century. Well, there was actually a trolley car, a, a a cable car when it was first built. Then they added additional train cars. Uh, up until the 40s, and then it got converted all to car and truck use. Right. Well, no truck use, just car use. I guess there's a there's there's a there's a truck size limit, right? Yeah, no, they removed the truck. There were no trucks, and when they did the change in the 50s, they removed the uh, well, didn't allow trucks at all. Trucks were not permitted on the bridge. Even like a a, a van truck cube van? Well, that's not no, not even no, no commercial traffic. No commercial traffic is permitted on the bridge, and it's been that way since 1950. You know, they occasionally drive over illegally, or the post, or the or the poli uh, police department sends over, but but no, com it's no commercial traffic is permitted at all. Period. I guess I violated that a few times <laughs> with a with a pickup truck. So I guess there's. Um... But so anything, anything larger than a pickup truck would be immediately um, sort of flagged as potentially commercial, I guess. Well, even a you know, they, you know, there's no commercial truck allowed in the FDR, same rule, and the police do patrol that. So even if you have a commercial pickup truck, you know, there's a good chance of getting stopped. They really do actually patrol that fairly heavily. Great. Well, thank, thank you for that clarification. John, did you have any other questions? Can you provide the traffic and bike statistics by hour that are currently using the bridge? Do you have that kind of information? Uh, we don't at our fingertips, but I'm sure it's available um, from DOT. I don't know if they've been doing um, over through COVID um, an analysis. And we understand there's a, re a bit of a rebound now with car traffic, which you know, had 
has gone up and down. So um, I don't know what the latest statistics are, statistics are right now, no. But, but you can get that and, and give it, if DOT has it, and give it to the community board? Yes, and I, I should say that the goal, in a way, the goal of this presentation is to, is to um, further our, our relationship with DOT and, and sort of create a platform for working with DOT who has supported the concept generally by saying that they, um, before a cable study is being done, they don't support the expansion of the promenade um, and therefore they do support the conversion of a traffic lane to a bike lane. So they're kind of already on board with the basics, but the particulars haven't been worked out yet. Sid, did you have any comments? Julia? I have a question. You know, you know, you're doing two way, a two way bike lane. You know, that's still going to be fairly crowded for bikes. Why are you considering the, in the two lane, the, the lane, the, uh, the lane of tra the traffic having a, a one, you know, a one eastbound lane for bikes and, and a, a separate westbound, you know, in, in the, and I understand the issue of the electric, of the electric bikes and the rebels and stuff, but, you know, the, the, why, why, you know, it would seem to me that if you're going to make it safer, as we know, one way traffic each way is safer than two way traffic from small, in a small area. It's a great question. Um, very, very good question and an important one for us. And there's several different um, ideas at play here. Um, one, one idea is, is that the entrance and exit conditions that the north and southbound portions, or sorry, the north and south sides of the bridge would require are quite distinct from each other. So we're trying to keep the bike traffic clustered to concentrate the activity and the benefits for those entrance and exits make it easier for bikes to basically manage um, the exit and entrance from either side. That's that's one one thing. The other is that we're not sure that doing both lanes at once is feasible uh, for a number of reasons. So we'd like to be able to have a fully operational system with even one lane deployed um, and see the second one as more of an expansion. Um, maybe it's a phase. 0 0.5 or something like that. And the other is that the the investment in the infrastructure for having getting on and off the bridge. I'm going to go back to this slide here for a second. Sorry, forgive me. Let me just myself. So um, these things are interlinked. These two ramp plazas that we're proposing are part of the self-funding strategy, i.e. they they create a kind of a charismatic space that is not only going to be great for bicycles, but it creates something interesting for a sponsor to get behind. So basically, these kind of picks for the project, you could say, because um, they've got um, something nice to show. Um, just putting a bike lane on the Manhattan bound side of the bridge on the inner lane doesn't really give you that. It's sort of a it's a fairly banal, potentially practical solution. Um, but it has its own it has its own um, challenges as well. I'm just going to go back one slide. Um, so it requires that it requires the bike to be on the inner lane of the bridge because of the exit and entering requirements. Whereas this one both opens up to and requires, in fact, the bikes to be on the outer lane of the bridge, which is a, a more pleasant experience because you're actually out there and with with the view and not sort of surrounded by the cars and it's all about how you're getting on and off the bridge at this point. So there are actually two fairly different solutions, and we think that they could work in synergy with each other. But your pictures actually show that in case they're on the outer lane. I mean, you, 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 you may be describing them differently, but the what 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 they're both the on the north side. It's the north. It's the northmost lane. On the south side, it's the southmost lane. I don't know why you're describing those. I mean, those are the outer legs. They're not. They're, they're the outest part of the bridge. It's not the inner part of the bridge. And, and let me let me go to that. It's it's um it's actually not. That's the um sorry. Just get back to that picture here. So here you can see it. It's it's the. 
Oh, on that lane, you're yeah. No, on that lane, you're. Doing you see what I'm saying? So this is looking. Why, why wouldn't you do the outer lane? Okay, so this is looking towards Brooklyn, just to be clear. So on the north side, it's the outer lane. On the south side, it's the inner lane. And the reason is getting on and off. So to get onto the outer lane, you have to have a, an access point that supersedes all of the the entrance ramps, and it becomes quite complicated. Uh, but it's doable. And and if we look at the bigger um, the bigger section here, let's see if I can. Ryan, I understand, but I also point out that picture has a button, which is the lad on the bridge. Right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Juliet. I think you can see. I think you can see it in this picture here. Is that the the inner lane is comes all the way out and basically takes you to Tillery, because you can't cross over in a bike onto the exit ramps, and likewise, and you, as you enter, you're entering off center and you're staying. You're hugging the inside all the way across. Oh, well, I understand. I appreciate. It. I I appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you, Zero. Yeah, I had a question. That, the, uh... Scott, this is a terrific uh, proposal. It's, it's really exciting, and I congratulate you on your effort. I, there's a slide there where you show um, an area on the platform of the bridge where there's a, a city bike area and maybe a commercial use and a little stopover. Can you bring that yes. up again? Yep. Almost there. Well, here you can see it. Um, you can see it from the aerial view here, and that yeah. little guy is the container. I, I was just gonna, with all the uh, biodiversity plantings that you're doing, I, I you you mentioned some about a commercial location. Would you consider just letting that be a a, a sort of a, a spot where people could stop and just be quiet and calm with some plantings and no commercial uh uh use at all, where they could just have a spot, a, a place where they could sort of contemplate and relax while they're on their journey and not have anything commercial, leave the commercial out and put your plantings and things like that. Would that be a consideration? Absolutely. Um, actually, th this this rendering really deserves to have some of that biodiversity in it. And I think we just didn't get it in at the last minute in the competition. But you can see in the distance just behind it's this. There's the vestige yeah. of one of the other micro forests. We're showing them up here it. on the top of the housing. But it, we should see in the foreground here some of that planting. What I will say about the commercial piece is our vision for this would be something very specifically tailored to um, cyclists and a very kind of modest um, tailor-made commercial um, adventure and maybe even a co-op run by cyclists. So it's it's not to be something attracting people up there for anything other than um, serving maybe coffee and water uh, to cyclists. So it's a very special, it's a very special um, idea of serving the cycling community. But it's, but by no means is it essential. We're not relying on revenue from that at all. Um, That's what I was getting at. I, no. I, th I think if you, if it, it, it seems to be your mission to include uh, biodiversity plus human activity, uh, I would just, uh, it's just a suggestion. I, far be it for me to make a suggestion on this creative. Uh, <laughs> proposal, but I just like to keep the commercial out off and let let them let people just enjoy the view. And if they want to stop and relax, that's a good thing, a bench or two. But mm -hmm. leave the the commercial because that brings food, that brings uh, trash, that brings other issues also. So that was just my point. Otherwise, it's a terrific proposal. Thank you very much. It's a great suggestion, and we we'll definitely will think about that. That's a that's the kind of thing that we want to have a community voice to really decide decide whether that's the right solution or not. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand raised, so I'm going to oh, ask a Juliet. question about the landmarks um, How do you, implications Juliet? of this. We yeah. had always Juliet. been back. Hand raised. Oh, yeah. How do you do this? OK, um, after um, the landmarks question, I will get to you, Sandy, then. Um, oh. Have you had any conversations with LPC? about um, potential landmarks implications. We had been told can't paint um, anything green. You can't paint green bike lanes on the Brooklyn Bridge. You can't even put a barrier in between the bike lane and the pedestrian lane on the Brooklyn Bridge. You can only put some um, lean demarcators. Um, okay, so explore it. It's a great question, Juliet. And um, 
there was a landmarks representative on the jury for the competition um, who we understand that from her directly was one of the greatest supporters of our uh, proposal. But that doesn't mean that, that that that's going to be a green light from landmarks. So uh, we absolutely have to explore the real ramifications and we haven't done that officially yet. Um, we have we've taken a very conserva uh, conservation oriented view to the to the promenade, but at the same time with the suggestion of expanding it under the um, kind of mandate of the competition. I should say that our original premise for Brooklyn Bridge Forest was not to expand the promenade at all, it was to work with the existing width um, and just use the forest as a sponsorship for the planks of the promenade, which is the 16 foot wide promenade as it stands now. So if the bike lane on the lower deck is successful, um, we could imagine that there is no bike lane on the upper deck um, on the promenade level. And that would basically take us back to our very original proposal where the, the pedestrian promenade is just for pedestrians up there. And then the landmarks issue would essentially go away because the promenade would not be affected. If, if the city, if there's a, if there's a strong mandate from the city to incorporate bicycles on the promenade, which, by the way, were not part of the original bridge design. When the bridge was originally designed, there were stairs on the promenade and there was no bicycles. Yeah, the bicycles were added in the, I believe it was in the 70s um, when the promenade was ramped. Um, and so you could you could say that it was never imagined that there were, it was never intended that there would be bicycles up there. Um, so solving the bicycle issue successfully on the lower deck could mean the promenade returns to pedestrian only. And and that's essentially what we're also doing in our in our solution because we've got we've offset the the um, uh, the bike lane on the upper level, but we do have this we do have this really strong feeling that bicycles up on the promenade are wonderful in the sense that they enjoy that experience in a very special way, and um, if you're in a bicycle on the lower deck amongst the car traffic, it's not the same experience. And if New York wants to sort of fully embrace bicycles, you know, in that in this type of experience, there's really no other way to do it than to have them up on the top. So we see one vision as the long term, you have both a lower deck bike lane and an upper deck bike lane. The upper deck would serve folks who want to have more of a, uh, you know, enjoyable um, view filled, air filled ride. Um, maybe you're taking your time. And the lower deck is more for people that are really their commuters. They're trying to get from point A to B as quickly as possible. Um, so these are some of the options that we have in mind. Sounds good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Sandy. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So um, maybe you said this, but um, my question is about um, mopeds and uh, the bicycles that have motors mm -hmm. that the delivery people use a lot, but um would they be going on the road with the traffic or with the bikers on the bike lane uh, i'm so glad you asked it sandy and because it gives me a chance to say again that that our concept is that we've got a separate dedicated lane for those those innovative um, electrically powered uh vehicles um so let me say a few more words about this uh the transportation landscape is changing quickly and we're seeing hybrids of all kinds that are being introduced that we don't know yet how to deal with. Um, you know, we've got scooters and bicycles. Some of those bicycles seem like a normal bicycle. Some of them are almost like a motorcycle and everything in between. Um, we, we've got, and, and every year from now into the future, we're going to have new vehicle precedents. Um, we want the, we, we see the Brooklyn Bridge as a platform for innovation on this kind of issue. And we don't want to hardwire it right now to serve a very particular understanding of vehicles that may be quite different in 10 years time, let alone in five years, let alone right now, because we're still trying to catch up with what's happening. So that's why we, we'd like to reserve this lane um, over here for sort of the innovation lane for the time being for, um, for open electrically powered hybrids. And possibly this eventually, you, you might expand that to two lanes. We don't really know. But, but that would mean that no electrically powered bicycles would be officially allowed on this other lane. 
perhaps there's a gray area there. I'm not sure exactly where you draw the line. Is that helpful? Well, I, I, you know, I I live on Atlantic Avenue. We have wide sidewalks, and uh, it's now. It used to be just the delivery people on the electric bikes, and for, before that, bicycles um, using the sidewalk. And now, maybe it has something to do with COVID because we're getting a lot of um, mopeds riding on the sidewalk. So there doesn't seem to be um, enforcement. I don't see it. And um, pedestrians are supposed to get out of the way. Um, it, it just it's it's very aggressive. Um, and so if if you know, I think you have to have some sort of plan about this. Um, <laughs> because it's like the wild west yeah and it's dangerous and and that's the problem with the way the bike lane the promenade now you have pedestrians and bikers in conflict so you're trying to separate them and i just want to say um in the 70s before the ramps i used to carry my bike up the steps <laughs> trying to get over the bridge and then the ramps came so that's that's great. It's 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 nice to hear the confirmation of that of that history and and that change from someone yes, who's, yes. who's used it. Yes, because I'm 75 today. Well, today, that's today. right. Congratulations. Andy, get some red cake. Now you yes. have to have some cake. I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna bring it out and show it to you later. Uh, okay. This is Cheryl. Hi. And then, and then yeah. we take Caroline Todd after Cheryl. Instead of a coffee shop, what about a, a bicycle repair, a mini bicycle repair shop? Because you know, or some place that you can get air or get bikes fixed or something instead of a coffee shop on that plaza. Actually, um, Cheryl, that's that's exactly what we were envisioning here. Um, you can see this is a repair shop in the end of this container. So, oh, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was really we thought about bike storage as well, possibly. So we're kind of we want to think we would only do this in conjunction with the cycling community and really understand what would be their priorities. So, again, it's definitely not a commercial venture for the fake for the sake of making money. It's only there to serve that community. Uh, I think a repair shop for light repairs would be fantastic, and they could even work with, say, um, uh, Recycle a Bicycle or one of the local organizations to do, um, you know, you could drop your bike off and have it, you know, picked up in a few days. There's different ways you could use it, but we would like to be really creative about that. Thank you for bringing that up. It's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, Caroline? Cool. Great. Thanks. Uh, there are a lot of things about this project I really like. Like, obviously, the number one goal is to provide more space for people walking and bicycling across the bridge, and this definitely does that. So, thank you. Um, my question with this kind of motivated toward equity and the planet is if this private 2.5 plus million dollars is financed from banks that also finance, you know, fossil fuels and other destructive things, will you take it? Oh, we'll think a, about public money. Um, that's a great question, and um, we we haven't got there yet. But that's a good time to ask the question, and um, it won't certainly be our decision solely. It would be a decision that would be made in a lot of consultation with other stakeholders. But um, what what has happened so far is that the interest that's been expressed has mostly come from new from local developers. Um, our, our goal would be to have a partner in this, not to someone to give us some money. It would be a partner who believes in this in the city and, and wants this space to be successful. Um, uh, the way we framed it so far is there would be very minimal branding presence. And obviously that's gonna be one of the kind of exchange value components, right? And we don't, I mean, here's the city bike right there. I, I, I'm. I'm, I'm reluctant to say we don't want it to be like city bike. Um, city bike is a great infrastructure, but we want it to be subtle and we want it to be meaningful. So we're looking for someone who who's will, who has that kind of funding available, um, but really has the vision for the project. And it would be very it would be very hypocritical if we um, you know Brooklyn Bridge Forest, which is all about um, 
conserving the rainforest, which we're all dependent on in this world, and have someone who's out there cutting them down. So, I mean, we there's definitely boundaries that we're going to have to put up before we consider funding from anyone. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we have uh, John Quint, uh, the last community board, uh, board member who is going to speak, and then we have three members of the community who are going to speak. Captain Rana is going to join in about five minutes. So um, let's try to keep um, the questions and responses uh, concise, please. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Julia. Um, I'm not a biker, I'm a walker. And pre-pandemic, I walked over the bridge back and forth every day to work and therefore have to contend with the bicyclists. Have, have you had any discussions with transportation alternatives about how they feel about this? Quick, one way, yes or no, have uh, they weighed in? Uh, yes, they were, they were um, on the jury um, that awarded us the prize. Um, so, and, and I have, you know, we have a, a history of working with them, but we haven't done the deep dive with them on this, you know, the nuances yet. So uh, that, that would be one of the important groups to work with in terms of, say, the ramp design, even because things that we're looking my, at my in this image. Is I've always, and not that walkers are not expedient, you looking for expediency, but bikers who use the bridge for commuting are looking for expediency. Mm -hmm. And entering on Park Row and exiting on Tillery is a straight shot. You're now forcing bikers on in Manhattan to go below the bridge and then to come up a steep ramp. And you're forcing bikers who are entering in Brooklyn, who would be at Tillery and Adams, to now, I don't know how they would get there. Would they go up to Cadman Plaza West, down Cadman Plaza West to the Triangle, having then taken all the elevation out and then having to reverse the elevation by climbing up your spiral ramp onto the bridge. I'm sure the gradient would be good, but they will have already expended all the downward energy and then have to reverse it. And on the converse side, on the on the Manhattan side, they're going to come down to well below the level of Park Row and City Hall, and they're going to have to divert from there. And I'm not sure, I've never biked down there, so I don't know how they will get down to the Park Row entrance, but just looking at that, there's no easy access. They, they can't go through police headquarters and they can't go around um, the municipal bridge. So have you considered the how you're gonna get bikers to not simply join the pedestrians anyway? Um, well, in terms of that, that part of it, the, once a bike lane has been, if there's only the bike lane on the lower deck, pre upper deck bike lane, there would be no bikes allowed on the promenade. Yeah, but, but that that that's that's the rule. But how do you enforce it? And how do you and 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 because you're give the the pedestrian walkway is an invitation to take the easy way and not to because bikes don't care about pedestrians. Pedestrians they're they're in the pecking order. Bikes are the alpha person. They don't want to be next to cars because cars are the alpha person. But when you now give them the choice of fighting with pedestrians yeah. and putting up with them versus making those long, to my mind, long detours down Cabin Plaza West and then up from uh, whatever that street is down there, Frankfurt or whatever the street that the bike lane ends on, how do you how do you invite them to do that? John, there's a there's a longer answer that I don't know whether we have time for, but we we have studied the connections and there's there are some compromises, but there's also some benefits. So it will shift the overall pattern of cycling um, for bridge users. Right now, we have it in our mind that Tillery and Center are sort of the um, entry points, but we're we're going to be shifting that. There are there are bike lanes that have just opened up down here. Um, on and Scott, road. I will just ask that you take John Quint's um, suggestions as, you know, a sure. pedestrian and a, you know, member of the community and then like, fo like follow yep, up on that. That's great. Them. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask um, Monica Greco, who's the first um, community member who uh, raised their hand, Monica. 
Hi, thanks, Juliet, and thanks, Scott, for this really exciting presentation. Um, I just had two quick questions. One is a follow up from John's, which is about whether there'll be other like disincentives for bikers to come onto the pedestrian path, because often some of the bike tours will go wherever wherever the view is, frankly, and I think those are some of the most dangerous bikers on the bridge. Um, but my second question was about the participatory model that you mentioned in your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that and what community engagement will look like both in this first term and, and in the in the mid to long term. Um, great question. So just really quickly on the on the disincentives. I mean, in the depending on how the phasing rolls out, but in the time period where there's um, a lower bike lane and no upper bike lane, enforcement on the promenade would be in my mind, relatively straightforward because there's sort of an absolute no bike riding on the bridge that that that, that becomes then a police sort of a policing issue, both self policing as well as something more formal. Um, and I can think of a variety of strategies, technologies and so forth to help with that. Um, to jump to community engagement, um, pilot project, um, our company has done a lot of work with. Um, what we call the sandbox method, which is getting stakeholders sort of around the table and designing things together. Um, we haven't actually formally created the first sandbox meeting yet. So we've our ideas are to work with um, groups in the in the in the NYCHA area around here for the microforest um, to work with the transportation groups and getting you know the right stakeholders. Obviously, there's a number of of institutions and organizations that we want to bring to the table, like transportation alternatives and a number of others. Um, we call it co-design, the idea that we're not coming with a fully formed solution, we're coming with ideas that need to be uh, worked through that kind of negotiation. So to some degree that answers John's last question is like, is this, is this the right solution? Um, we can't say that it is for sure, but we think it's a good place to start. And once we have those folks around the table, uh, we'll, We'll quickly get a, a, a good idea of whether it is or not. But if you if you want to know more about our process um, called the sandbox, you can you can Google it. There's a video about our process and what it looks like in some of the projects in New York City that we've done um, in the Lower East Side. Um, so that will be will be hands on and it will be fun and it will be um, taken seriously by us and and you know we we hope by the entire uh, approval process. And this process where you're reaching out to community board two and Manhattan community board one is appreciated as well. Thank you. It's a cr critical, critical part of all of this. Great. Um, Eric Walter, you're next. Thank you, Juliet. And thank you, John. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my question has to do with uh, Caroline's uh, question from earlier about funding. Can you share any information with the community board about who these potential sponsors are? or uh, what that process looks like? Um, I can't share much because there isn't a lot of specifics to share yet other than outreach that we've just started, feelers with you know, friends in the, in the community basically who work in different sectors who have said, you know, I'm working with this company that you know, they're really interested in what you're doing. Um, the real estate angle has come up a few times, so uh, I'm, I'm not avoiding the question, but there really isn't much to say other than what we've heard is this is not a lot of money. Um, even despite this rough economic times, there's companies that are in New York for the long haul that could actually come up with these kinds of funds um, who would believe in the project enough not to demand a too high a degree of, of kind of brand presence. So there's been about four or five developers that have been named. Um, we haven't even reached out to them yet. They're being sort of I won't even say courted yet. They're just being maybe gently introduced to the idea. And I think it's, a, it's going to be a learning process. Uh, you know, we may find that it's a lot harder than we think. Um, on the other hand, if in fact we can do this for, for less than $3 million um, with this kind of impact, that's, that's totally doable. Um, at the end of this presentation, I had a bunch of slides uh, under, under precedence and the precedents of the of the New York City kind of art projects like the Falls and um, discovering Columbus were quite important to us to think about how New York City has done this in the past. Um, 
Water on the Go, a program that we really loved and, and worked with EP on years ago. Um, you know, you would have all been, you know, I'm sure seen the falls when they were up. And, you know, this is this is done. It's there's a way to pay for it and it it has an impact. What we're doing is actually something that has a much greater impact for people uh, in terms of you know real impact in their lives than these art projects, which are much more expensive. So Scott, I want to thank you. Um, Captain Rana has joined our meeting. Um, I know we had another member of the community who um, had a question. Alec, perhaps you wouldn't mind emailing your question to the community board and then Scott could get back to you individually. Would that be okay? That's fine with me. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to take questions and, and feel free to share my email address and, and I'll circulate it to our team and we will maintain contact with you all and, and hope to work with you further. Thank you. Julia. At, the, at the end of the meeting, we'll do a motion um, to support your presentation. That's great. And we'll Juliet, stick around for that. Juliet, in the questions that are going to be answered, if the uh, company can also answer the disruption on current traffic, be it bike, car, or pedestrian on the bridge, and the length of time it is anticipated for this project to be completed and whether there is a bike surface that minimizes speeding. That's it. So if you could get back to us, Scott, uh, and those uh, answers will be distributed to our committee members. Would you like me to stay on until we go through the resolution phase or? Um... It will be a while, so you don't have to do that. Okay, then we, we will stay tuned and uh, look forward to getting those questions and providing as much feedback as we can for the community board. A very nice presentation. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Captain Rana, we welcome you and congratulate you. Um, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Juliet. And thank you all the members uh, that are present. Thank you for accommodating us. We know things come up last minute and uh, we are happy to hear you speak about your goals for the 84th precinct, and um, we would be happy to share with you our um, thoughts as well. No, definitely. Um, again, I apologize. Um, you know, I should have been here. Was it six o'clock? Uh, but at the same time, we had a, a, a 911 call. Uh, a man with a firearm, so that's why we had to run out. Safety um, first. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, it's great to be in this neighborhood. It's a very unique and uh, diverse uh, area, whether it's residential business or whether it's the people that live or uh, live or even work or even pass through here. So it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Uh, and of course, you know, such an important location comes with a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges and a lot of demands, you know, um, uh, whether it's the crime area, whether it's quality of life or whether it's just, you know, uh, a day to day. Uh, issues that we might encounter, but uh, I'm I'm glad that you know uh, we have partners such as yourselves and uh, other uh, in this community that are willing to help each other and help us uh, serve every single one of uh, you guys. Uh, so I'm really really glad and happy to be in this uh, uh, precinct and this neighborhood, and I'm looking forward to working with every single one of you guys. Um, you know, I always say, you know, I'd be lying if I say I'm going to solve all the problems. But I'm telling you one thing, whatever comes up, we can look at more than 100% and make sure that we can uh, assist and uh, be there for every single person. We really appreciate you taking the time to come meet us and come talk to us. Um, and we have um, spoken to some of the NCO officers have come out to the community board meetings. Um, I guess I'll just start with, um, you know, our our primary concern with public safety is um, the gun violence that has increased throughout the city um, and um, understandably the, the related gang activity that, uh, that uh, leads to that violence. So maybe as a start out, could you let us know what, what's being done yeah. on that end? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, uh, maybe it was my bad luck or maybe whatever you want to call it, but as soon as I got assigned him, we, we took four shootings in uh, Farragut um, and I'm pretty sure it would have been more, but thank God, knock on wood, it wasn't. Um, the way the shots fires were being coming over um, and we were dealing with the, the situations. Um, but 
we we took four. Um, obviously, we're not used to it this in this neighborhood. Uh, but just Farragut alone, I have at least four to six officers, twenty four seven, patrolling that area in the hot spot locations. Um, you know, and doing uh, you know visits to each building to make sure that you know we don't have any crew members, or gang members uh, with a firearm or or um, you know, just lingering around looking for their target because there's a lot of gang on gang uh, or crew on crew, I should so call it, uh, violence. And um, some of it comes from other part of the city and some is just internal. But um, we did have an individual that got shot. He's from Farragut, but he got shot in uh, somewhat of uh, Bed-Stuy, Fort Greene area. Uh, you know, he did die, um, you know, should I say, you know, that um, it, it, it reduced some type of uh, violence in the area because of it, or, or at the same time, we are looking at retails where more individuals are trying to come into this neighborhood to take their revenge for his uh, killing. So, you know, but the challenge is every day, that's why we have so many officers uh, dedicated just into those hotspots um, when it comes to, you know, the gun violence, you know, that's why some uh, areas, uh, you know, obviously we get complaints about seeing less officers in other areas. You know, you will see that it's because <coughs> more is concentrated on violence. And then, you know, to, that doesn't mean they're not out there. They're not answering the 911 calls or 311 calls, but it's just you probably won't see as many because we are concentrating at this time on the violence rather than anything else. But um, and thank God, you know, those were it. And we had, you know, uh, I don't want to put a Band-Aid or, you know, whatever you word you want to use it. But, you know, we're looking at um, hoping that there are no more shootings, uh, at least for the rest of the year, uh, because of the, the, the deployment that we have. Thank you. Um, do you have, uh, we had heard in the past that because our community district houses the court systems, that sort of attracts um, rival um, no, gang members. Good. Do you have any theories about the increase yeah. in gun violence? Well, in regards to that, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I shouldn't use these words, but I think we're, because of COVID, we've been lucky uh, uh, because courts are closed. So we don't deal with any uh, in-person, uh, um, you know, like people coming in for cases. Because what used to happen, uh, the biggest issue was the morning time court and court being right next to a shopping district that would, you know, uh, bring more people and have them linger around for a longer period. And what happens is when you go to court, you know you're going to get uh, uh, checked for, uh, you know, weapons or other uh, things. So people come without weapons. So now the rivalry uh, gangs, they know that you have a court date at what time it's open source information or whether they know through other crew members. So now is the time they can confront these individuals. So this is why we had some issues with uh, uh, shootings near courts uh, and the Fulton uh, um, shopping district. And at the same time, you know, we, uh, since I remember when these things were happening, when we increased our manpower uh, and patrol in and around the court area, we were able to get, you know, individuals with firearm or find locations where they were hiding the firearm before they go into court. So, you know, at the same time, when I'm mentioning that, you know, that's why it's very important that we get the input. And that's why it's very important that we get the cooperation from the community members and people like yourselves that, if you see something, you know, let us know because we can't be everywhere at any, you know, at all the time. But if you see something suspicious, you know, we'll definitely investigate it. I'll give you an example. Um, I, like I mentioned before, we recovered a few firearms because the community member saw somebody, you know, uh, stashing it by a vehicle, by the tire or, or in a construction area underneath the cone you know, or something like that, we would have never, you know, we're not going to go inspect the cones, you know, until someone tells you, you know, so we were able to find firearms like that. And perfect example today, the one that, you know, I had to run out to, there was another passerby, he saw somebody near the court, um, something that looked like a firearm being stashed into, on top of a tire or a vehicle, you know, so 
again, if we don't get the cooperation from the community, um, you know, we, we can't pretty much we can't do our job uh, to full satisfaction. That's why I say it's very important to have the community and police working together in every angle. You know, like, uh, obviously there's going to be uh, issues, disagreements, or whatever. That's what we hear and have an open dialogue to work together and come up with solutions to, you know, serve every single person. Thank you, Captain. Um, I'm going to open it up to uh, my fellow committee members um, to to speak with you, um, and then um, afterwards, I would be happy if you would um, hear our district needs relating to public safety. That would be great. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Um, committee members. Well, if there's anybody that I, would I like to speak. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so, hi, hi, Captain Reina. How you doing? I've been getting your holiday um, information about what each holiday means uh, over the year or so. So that's nice. Thank you. Um, I have a question about an incident on Atlantic Avenue. I think it was last week. Um, uh, the Times Plaza post office at uh, between 3rd and 4th. There was a robbery and uh, it, it was at gunpoint. Um, the person took uh, wallets from from the customers in the post office, and I wondered if you had any information on that because we didn't really get any. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I was, it was shocking, and I'm, I don't know. I mean, I, who walks into a post office? Uh, you know, I usually hear that in the bank. So what happened? I'll give you the breakdown. Was the person walks up to the teller and demands with a note saying, "I got a gun." Uh, give me your money. And, you know, the banks are trained to just hand over the money. Don't talk to them, nothing. The post office guy is, are you kidding me? And he walks away from him. He's like, get the hell out of here. So, of course, you know, the guy is like, what the hell just happened? Oh, I shouldn't say guy because we don't know if it was a he or she, you know. Um, so we don't know if it was a male or female. But at that, you know, because it was uh, it had a wig on and all that stuff. So, but anyway, so while walking out, he sees somebody with um, uh, a wallet or a phone, or uh, you know, obviously with the phone. So he comes back, said, "Oh, give me! I'm going to shoot you. Give me your wallet and give me that phone also." Um, so of course we tried. Meet, and he walks out immediately. We tried to track the phone, um, but we were unsuccessful, un un unsuccessful because the person that owned the phone wasn't able to log on to his uh, Find My iPhone. And so we weren't able to track it down right away. But within minutes, this is how quick people travel. Within minutes, the same person was using the credit card on Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, Atlantic Ave uh, or at a, at a grocery store. Uh, so, you know, we obviously have uh, uh, a video. We have the pictures of the person. Um, there is, uh, they, they are working on um, the case, trying to get a better video and better picture from the grocery store. Um, the postal off the police is uh, working with our detectives uh, to make sure that uh, we get this person uh, um, apprehended immediately as soon as we can. But other than that, I mean, no one was hurt, thankfully. Um, but this is how it actually went down. Thanks, Captain. Other uh, committee members? I mean, while somebody's, if, if somebody, somebody's thinking about any questions about it, I'll just mention the other thing I see rise in this neighborhood is uh, uh, package thefts that, uh, you know, people are leaving in their, um, whether it's in the lobby or in front of their houses. Uh, just if, you know, if we can have everyone you know, come up with a system, um, you know, either a location where you can put in the, the building, which is secure, or, or, or have it delivered when someone is home or have it delivered to somewhere where somebody is there. Because a lot of times these individuals they do is they drive a walk around um, and they see they they'll just peek the head in through the windows. If they see a package or something, what they'll do is they'll break the door and enter that location. That's how you know they are stealing. If there were times that it, they just got vitamins out of it, but we are taking you know bur burglary because it was by you know they, they took it by uh, breaking into a, a location illegally. Uh, so you know it, it's best to protect. I know we all, especially with COVID, you know, everything is by mail. Um, you know, we all do our shopping by mail. 
Um, so, you know, and that's just something to think about. That's what's, you know, really driving our crime in the last 28 day period is the burglaries. And most of them are either, you know, a storage area where the bikes were stolen or the packages that when someone broke into the building. Um, the other one that I saw the issue that I'm looking at is, you know, car theft. You know, the car theft, and it's all not because there's people out there looking for, you know, like a back in all day, you know, they would jimmy their cars, you know, in the car and leave. This is more, you know, because of us, we being lazy. You know, I, I'm probably guilty over myself, but I try to educate myself every day not to do it. Um, but, you know, we want to run into the store because we don't want to turn the car off or for AC purpose or now the winter is coming because of the heat purpose. Uh, and within seconds, I've seen some surveillance cameras. Um, the person, as soon as they walk into the store, the car is gone. Uh, and I, we've seen so many of those cars. And, you know, just for this precinct alone for car theft, we have 37 for the year. Um, and within the, the last 28 day we, period, we have seven. So you, it can tell you that how many, you know, it's, it's growing. This uh, car theft is a big issue. Juliet, I have a question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Captain Reyna. It, it's, it's great to see you coming to our meeting. I, I, come more often. You're very welcome to come. I, 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 was, I was hoping we, we can do this in person, but hopefully soon we'll get rid of this COVID thing and then uh, we'll be done. Uh, I just, but just while, while I'm saying that, it's also all of you are more than welcome to, if you are comfortable, you know, my door is always open. Uh, if you have any issues or something like that, I know Robert Paris is great. You know, uh, we have a great relationship, but you guys are also welcome, um, you know, to stop by at the precinct. My office door is open for you guys. And, and I, Cheryl, I wanted to just say that um, uh, two, I just wanted two. to mention Cheryl um, because she's being quiet. Um, Cheryl Gelbs, the co-chair of the committee, is on the um, 84th Precinct Council. Correct. I just wanted to commend two two of your officers, Hunt and Detective uh, Condon, who have been great um, representatives of the police department, and, and they become actually friends uh, in the community. So uh, if that if that happens all over, I think it'd be a great advantage for for, all, for the community and the police. Now, those are two two of my best guys, and uh, you know, like you said. I, I give their examples to a lot of other officers and a lot of other NCO officers, you know, because they are not only about fighting crime, but they're also about connecting. They're also about solving issues, you know, whether it's a small issue or not. And I'll just give you a heads, you know, like a little, uh, just uh, earlier today, you know, because we also have an issues about bikes that are being stolen. You know, some of them, are, we don't, we don't see it because it's like very, you know, like it's a couple hundred hour bike. So, you know, some, People not, might not uh, report it or it's not tracked as a felony, but we do have a lot that are very expensive bikes, 2000 3000 5000 dollars bike. But we just did an operation in Condon and Hunt was uh, part of that operation where we, where we set up a, a sting to see if we catch somebody, uh, you know, unclipping a bike or stealing it. So these guys are always, you know, thinking about, you know, ways to make sure that you, all of you guys are safe. So these are one of the best officers. So thank you. Could I, uh, Patrick, okay. Oh, Patrick, uh, go ahead. Captain, very nice to meet you uh, over the camera. Um, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, to, so I have two questions. Uh, one, I'll preface by uh, repeating what, what Ciro said. Uh, Condon and Hunter are, are excellent and, uh, and, and kind of along the lines of what you just said. They're very curious, interested, detail-oriented. You know, re they reach out. Uh, it's great. Is there so the first question is 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 what what are the budget prospects for that program? Is that is that uh is that still is there any talk of not continuing that? Is if there's any cuts made due to the fiscal issues? Um, as far as I know, NCO is like one of the uh the model that the the, the department still pushing. You know, we want to make sure we have officers just like. Uh, Condon and Hunt. That's why it's not everybody's not an NCO person. You know, like that's why you have these people, you know, for different sectors uh, that are handpicked, so we can make sure that they are well-rounded. 
They know how to fight crime. They know how to connect with people. They know how to, you know, be social workers and police officers at the same time. So uh, as of right now, I have not heard any uh, cuts to that program or eliminating that program. I think if anything, you know, some, it, I'll be honest with you, a lot of uh, people have come up and said, oh, why can't we have more NCOs? You know, the, the issue is having more NCOs will mean the same thing as patrol. You'll have so many people concentrated, so you won't have that one-on-one -on -one touch anymore. So th these individuals are there to have that one-on-one -on -one touch with every single person in that uh, sector. So that's why you only see those two people in the oh, okay. sector, Adam. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they always can bring in other uh, other colleagues, which is great too. Um, so, second question is, um, without getting into you know the debate on it, um, the the discussion around uh, funding changes um, and other other protests have, I would imagine, I, I, I'm certain, have affected your your deployment and your and your training and and your communications and team management. And I'm just curious to understand specific ways that you can share um, uh, that you have managed through that environment of the last uh, several months. Yeah, you know? I mean, it, 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 that, it definitely brings a big toll and, and, a, and a challenge, uh, especially when, you know, it comes to like quality of life issues or, or minor issues, you know, because when you, you mentioned deployment, when, you know, we only have limited resources, we want to make sure we Concentrate, concentrate those resources towards violence or or, 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 or felony crimes where you know people's lives are in danger. Um, you know that doesn't mean we looking away from anything else, but it just might be the re the resources might not be there uh, to you know fully address it uh, immediately. It might take some time. Um, so it is challenging. And, you know, it, obviously, downtown Brooklyn, being downtown Brooklyn, the hot spot for everything. Uh, we have the Brooklyn Bridge, we have the Manhattan Bridge, we got the Cabinet Plaza Park, we got, you know, Borough Hall, where we have the BLM um, uh, mural, we have Columbus Statue, you know, every day um, we have some type of pop-up protest. Uh, not to mention, you know, the teachers, now we have the Board of Education, every, you know, a couple of days a week, um, you know, during the weeks, they, people, the teachers will come in here. Uh, then you had the Landlord and Tenant Court, you know, people were protesting in front of that because of the the, the tenant, uh, the, 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 I guess the policies because of COVID, they were changing uh, due to rent control. So there's a lot of stuff happening in this area. Um, and, you know, to manage that, it is challenging, but, you know, we, we are doing it. And, um, you know, we, that's why a lot of people say, oh, we don't see officers all the time. You know, they're there, you know, we're, we're, we're making sure that you know, uh, we respond to every single request. We, you know, whether it's a three hundred one or or nine hundred one call. Um, you know, it's, so deployment is affected, but we are trying to manage it as much as possible. Um, you know, a lot of time we get outside help uh, when it comes to uh, large protests uh, or or demos. Um, so you know, that that is very helpful. But you know, just to mention, you know, we have to keep extra officers, let's say, by the Columbus Park and and Borough Hall because we want to make sure those facilities are uh, safe. So that eliminates those four or five out officers from, let's say, patrolling Farragut or patrolling, you know, Dumbo or patrolling any other area. Thank you, yeah, I appreciate that. And you got, you really are ground zero. Um, yeah. I just, it's, 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 a, it's an important debate to have, you know, you mentioned the social service side of the, wor of the work and, and it's an important debate to have and hopefully it can be had in a, constructive way. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's also. So, so I do want to stay on this topic uh, for us because we did have um, a heart to heart um, conversation about it in our uh, committee and um, as, as moderated by some some folks in the criminal justice arena. I know John Quint, you have a question. Is it about this uh, topic? John Quint? About the you Black Lives said, Matter movement, the, you know, the... Yeah, that, I wanted to, and I mean, it, it, it sort of, you, you sort of picked up on the theme that I wanted to yeah. go to because Ciro and Patrick just before and other people have commented that um, we all love our local cops. You know, they're the retail 
side of the of the picture. And if you ask an individual, you know, it, most people will say they've always had good interactions with people out of the 84th or out of the 88th, which also cover us. But at the same time, police in general, not a specific person or a specific precinct, have obviously come under attack, sometimes physical and certainly uh, political attack. And you've got your, your and I think uh, uh, Patrick just said that, you know, your precinct is, has been since uh, the killing of George Floyd, a big part, a big central part of uh, the issues that have unfolded in protests because Barclays became a centerpiece of gathering and then people would move from Barclays onto the Manhattan Bridge roadway or walkway onto the Brooklyn Bridge roadway or walkway. And I live on Adams Street and there were confrontations right in front of my building that were not pleasant, not pleasant for the cops and not pleasant for the protesters. And that kind of uh, activity and behind my house is Manhattan Bridge. So where there were a lot of criticism of the police in general for uh, uh, putting, forming a uh, cattle pen and hemming in uh, demonstrators and not letting them either continue over the Manhattan Bridge or disperse as they wanted to do. And I know you're, even though you hold a high rank and you command, we just saw the, the Rob Paris just circulated the uh, head counts at the various precincts. Do you have a large staff because of the, your, the staff having to serve not just the residents of the precinct, but the people who our precinct is the physical boundaries of the precinct are flooded by people every day because of the courts and because of Fulton, Fulton Mall and because of all the buildings along Court Street. And we have lots of businesses and uh, who bring in a lot of people. And of course, we have all of the subway stations, which bring people in, not to mention schools and everything. So we've got, we, we spent, and Julia started to talk about that, we spent the whole meeting talking about defunding the police and controlling the police and stopping the police. I believe we used the word reallocation of funding. All oh, right, we called it reallocation. Uh, excuse me, thank you, Julia. But um, you, you have, um, you know, I have no idea if any of the officers under your direct command have been the subject of complaints, but how do you, for all of us, for, uh, for the people who live here and the people who come in, what's your role and what's your philosophy on avoiding the conflicts that have, you know, been on a daily basis and for many months after uh, Memorial Day, they've calmed down, but who knows, we got an election in three weeks, who knows what kind of reaction is gonna come after that. How are you, uh, how do you deal with the, what we would, as we were talking about, the peaceful citizens who are reacting with the NYPD as opposed to the, you know, we've talked about crimes and those are the people we want you to interact with, but not the people who are uh, lawfully and peacefully protesting. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Uh, one thing about NYPD is uh, it's one of the most diverse, largest police department, if not in the nation, but the whole, you know, the world. Um, and the other beauty is that NYPD has been always been proactive in reaching out to the communities and being there for the, uh, uh, the communities before anything goes wrong. You know, obviously we're gonna have issues, we're all human. Uh, there's gonna be some person that's gonna mess up. Um, but as far as, and there are check and balances for that, you know. Um, there are, you know, like you guys can call, you know, uh, CCRB, you, you know, any person to call uh, to make a complaint. Like if there's a criminal issue, they can call internal affairs. Then we have our own, inter you know, for the precinct alone, we have individuals that's, you know, uh, um, there to inspect the, the officers, test them, you know, uh, uh, how they respond to uh, different 
jobs or you know or they'll call up the the police station on the phone how they interact with that person on that phone so the, these are tests that be done uh throughout the you know the years or days or you want to uh uh whatever you know, you want to mention uh and then of course if someone fails that test there's a you know a, depending on what the, the issue is then they they dealt with in that accordingly um you know but Everyone I know for sure that NYPD, like especially in the April police, you know, we're here to work with every single person. You know, whether you want to uh, protest or you want to just hang out and talk to an officer, or you're a victim of a crime, or you have any other issues, you know, the officers are there to help you out. Um, you know, this is what the beauty about it is. You know, you have the free, you know, you have the freedom to, you know, have your voices heard, and we're here to make sure that everyone gets to do that safely and, uh, uh, you know, obviously we want to make sure it's not violently done with, you know, uh, as long as you're within the law, we're, we're going to stand with you um, and, and help you out as much as possible. Thank you. Are there other questions from community board members? Okay. Um, Captain, I'd just like to share with you some highlights of the uh, priorities that we put together um, in our recent meetings um, that would be applicable to the NYPD. Um, uh, one of the uh, main ones is um, training. So we would, we would support increase in officer training for dealing with persons uh, with men mental health issues or homelessness or drug or other issues. Um, as well as uh, de-escalation training um, of officers um, when they are responding to um, uh, calls um, and bias and sensitivity trainings. So that was one of our um, uh, priorities. Um, maybe you could speak to some of your initiatives that you may be working on in that regard. Well, the, the, um, the NYPD, as whole has mandated every single officer, supervisor, and everybody uh, to go into a crisis intervention training, which is like a three day, which is the same thing. They, you work with different scenarios. Uh, you know, you, there's a psychologist, and you know, like there's a presentation about everything. It's a three day course, you know, training course. Um, at the end, they do the workshops. So, you know, they are on top of it. Uh, and you know, to how to interact with and how to de-escalate, like you said, you know, how to buy that few minutes uh, with that emotionally disturbed person that, you know, it might not take to the next level. Uh, so, you know, they, they are already on working on that, uh, not working on it, they have been working on that. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, every officer should or, have, or is a, should have been already trained in uh, crisis intervention training. And the other one you mentioned, um, the biases training, um, I think every person again was mandated to uh, attend uh, a, a training which deals with, you know, your biases internal. Everyone is biased in one way or the other. Uh, so, you know, like that was another training that was given to every single person. They had outside, uh, um, uh, I guess, firm or you know, or or entity that came in and actually did the whole. Uh, training for every single officer. That's good to know. That's great. Thank you. Um, one of the other ideas kind of um, uh, relevant to that is um, the suggestion that first responders um, sometimes be mental health professionals um, if the issue is a mental health emergency and um, not necessarily a, uh, a crime being committed. Um, it could be somebody threatening to harm themselves or somebody else, but it's a somebody with a mental health issue. Is that anything that's being talked about? Um, rather than having um, a police officer respond, having a trained mental health professional respond to those issues? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I know I've, I've only heard about those things, but nothing in, you know, in writing or anything. I mean, especially with, you know, now, you know, like John mentioned defunding or reallocating, uh, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, there's a lot of resources that are being, you know, either 
put on shelf or you know rethought of. Uh, and I think one of them I heard was let's say it's not related to this, but like you know crime victim uh, you know specialists. Like you know they would have a representative that would reach out to like domestic violence victims or or any elderly or other crime person. You know like so all these things are being thrown around. But we don't know anything right now that um, uh, is concrete uh, it, what, to what you just mentioned. Thank you. Yes. Uh, generally, we did support the reallocation of funds to promote more social services, community building, and and um, economic economic and educational opportunities for the at risk population mm -hmm. that may otherwise be you know committing committing so crimes. I, I'll be honest with you. I know there's a lot of talk. I mean, again, not to be. Um, uh, you know, like uh, uh, political or anything like that. It's just, you know, it, the department, if depending on the resources, you know, th there's a lot of programs that it does, especially with the youth, at risk youth. Um, and, you know, I, I remember I used to run a sports league, you know, for, I ran it for 10 years for kids under 19. Uh, and all that money came from, you know, the, the, the funds that the city allocated. And because of that, I, I run into individuals that, you know, I'd be shocked. I can't recognize every single player or any, you know, they will come up to you and say, look, you, I was in your, you know, program and the person is a doctor or a lawyer. I have a few of those guys that became police officers. So, you know, they, they say that, you know, these programs actually help them um, instead of, you know, uh, getting, you know, getting them in the right path instead of them going into the wrong path. So I think, you know, these programs, you know, uh, a very, you know, critical for our communities, you know, build up, you know, not everything is what you see, you know, the, the just the cars driving around and that's it, you know, there's a lot of programs, a lot of community engagement that goes on uh, with these funds. That's great. And it's great to hear that you participated in that. So no, it's it's awesome. Um, and then one um, final one that is it's kind of, you know, it's not really in the realm of this discussion. It is, uh, it's off to the side. It doesn't, you know, it's not a nationwide um, issue, but the placard parking abuse, it's just, <laughs> it's just a thorn in our sides. And, you know, anything you can do to think about ways to address that would really be appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I know that, again, this is a hot spot. Uh, you have so many agencies here. Uh, and as you can see, how the streets are so narrow and tight and providing parking for all these agencies and all these different units, you know, it's a, it's a very challenging, you know, part, uh, you know, I'm getting blown up on Twitter every day. So, you know, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, that's not a, a concern. I mean, if you come into the precinct, every officer, you know, they're posted everywhere where they're supposed to park, where they're not supposed to park. Uh, where they can use and where they can't use their placards. Uh, some of them is what people forget sometimes is the 8-4 precinct is the 8-4 precinct. You know, if you, if there's a traffic agent, they don't belong to the 8-4 precinct. They belong to another, you know, unit. You know, if they're doing something, that doesn't mean the 8-4 precinct is not doing, you know, their job or something like that. So we're trying to stay on top of it. Uh, I know we're getting a few calls. Uh, you know, I think uh, we got an email today about uh, Cathedral Place or uh, uh, Cathedral and I think a street right next to it. I, I Kat, uh, Catherine, I, I don't remember the the, other, uh, uh, the the street, but it was right next to the one. Uh, again, there's construction going on there. The, the sidewalk is already closed. Uh, so this should be no, you know, they're not getting any pedestrian traffic or anything like that. So if they park in there, um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that we're going to go out and, you know, uh, start enforcing because that's another agency, that's their location, you know. So, but we're, we're trying to stay on top of it, especially with the bike lanes and bus stops, you know, to make sure that, you know, none of the, those things are uh, uh, obstructed, but, you know, so many vehicles, if you drive around, you know, um, with having only four uh, RMPs, four sectors um, to work, you know, it's not easy job just to go and just, you know, dedicate one person just to start writing summonses, um, you know, and they have to do other duties. 
while you know throughout their tour. So you know if they get the the call or they 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 get to respond or they get to see something, they will take that. Thank you. Um, now, if you have time for a couple more questions, um, yes, sure. I just wanted to. Is there anybody else from the community board that uh, has any more questions? Otherwise, I'm going to open it up to the community. Juliet, I had one more question, if you don't mind. Quick. Sarah. Yeah, I, I was just curious, Captain. I mean, how many police officers are, are in the 84th precinct, and do you expect that amount to stay steady? Um, we have about uh, give and take with civilians officers assigned to like the Metro Tech area, Brooklyn Bridge, and you know we have about 200, uh, 200, about 250 uh, officers, um, but. Some of them, again, are fixed at certain locations, so they can't be touched to do anything else. Um, and to increase, I'm afraid we'll probably even go low instead of high because there are no academy classes as of right now. There is a, a, a talk of an academy class that might start next week, I think it is, uh, but it's still not confirmed yet. Um, so if that happens, you know, the number is obviously going to go low instead of high uh so i'm i'm hoping that's not the case you know because you know it's hard enough to do the job with the um with, you know uh, with the people that we have but um you know but we'll try to manage that's what i'm saying like it's, it's challenging and especially you know someone mentioned election coming up and we already foresee a lot of uh demos um so you know we're hoping for the best Thank you. Um, any questions from the community? Caroline, does anybody have their hand raised? No, no one indicated. Okay, um, Captain, we thank you very much for participating in this discussion. Ms. Kalanchung? Oh, yes. Um, there are two hands, Caroline Todd and um, someone named Victoria. Oh, great. Caroline and first and then Victoria. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Rana, for coming to speak with us. I really appreciate your time. I'm, I'm not, so when officers have to go to a protest at the last minute, what is, is there one single duty they're being pulled from or is it an NCO officer and another type of officer. What what types of officers are just the 84th precinct currently have? Well, well everyone is assigned to patrol, and then they have other, uh, you know, assignments. Uh, like the NCO officers, we try not to touch them uh, unless it's like really really necessary. Even if we have to eliminate the patrol officer, uh, what we will do is you know backfill them with the NCO, so they will be in their own sector doing patrol. Uh, so we don't lose, you know, uh, the, the dedicated individuals uh, to protest. So, you know, but depending on how big and what's the time, you know, if, they, if a pop-up protest happens right now, um, you know, we might have to use every single person uh, that's working and then for reinforcement from other pieces uh, that will come in Give us a hand. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, Victoria. Thank you. Um, thank you for being available for questioning, Captain Rana. Um, I'm part of a community education group. We, on the weekends, go to different statues of Columbus around the five boroughs and we do teach-ins for the community about you know relearning history and things like that um and we've noticed since we've been doing these since July at every statue there's at least one police car um sometimes up to 10. um and at one of our teach-ins we had as many as 15 um, police cars respond to our teaching um, and it's very peaceful. We weren't defacing anything and I get there's a lot of tension, especially around Columbus statues. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that's not how your department wants to spend their resources. And we can obviously see it's very expensive to even have one officer patrol a statue for 24 hours. So I wanted to ask, 
why don't we remove the statues and then they wouldn't have to be patrolled and they wouldn't incur the ire of the community. Um, and it just seems like the easiest, quickest solution to having to patrol statues that people don't want around. Um, and if this committee and the police department would be supportive of efforts to peacefully remove the statues of Columbus, at the very least in front of the Kings County building and a Supreme Court building in downtown Brooklyn. Well, that's something that you would have to bring up to your local elected official. We have nothing and no say in that uh, our situation. You know, we get to make sure the property and the lives are protected. Thank you. And Victoria, we can um, uh, continue that conversation uh, amongst our committee after um, Captain Rana is uh, finished with it. Thank you. Okay, I wanna thank you again, uh, Captain, for joining us and uh, we hope that you will again soon. Hello, excuse me, Juliet, there's another question, Eric. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Captain Rana, I was curious, what is the department's policy on uh, whether or not patrol is done in a car or in a walking patrol and do you have any kind of leeway over that policy or kind of what the breakdown is between those two different types of patrol uh what what do you mean like the walking over vehicles yeah like like cops walking a beat um as opposed to kind of driving around in a neighborhood well you know you have it depends on what area you're like if you're in Fulton street if you when especially when the holidays are coming up uh, we're going to have individuals on foot posts uh, throughout Fulton Street and uh, and the shopping area around it. So those people will be, you know, on foot patrol. And then you have patrol officers that respond to 911 jobs. They have to be in the vehicle um, to respond to different areas as quickly as possible. And then even then, they are instructed to do uh, some of their time, available time uh, on foot. You know, it's called, you know, uh, a community visit, you know, so they, they're supposed to go and interact with people uh, in their community. But other than that, I mean, there's no such, you know, I don't think there's anything that, you know, that one has to do you know, over the other. Is there anything that we can do as a community to encourage more kind of community visit time or or kind of encourage the officers to, to be outside of their cars more frequently if you know, if it means to know when they'd be there or, you know, be able to say hi to them or walk up to them. No, no definitely. Like I mean, listen, interaction is the most important thing. You know, that's how you learn about each other, learn, learn about the situations and, you know, and be more, you know, transparent with everyone, you know. So I welcome, uh, you know, speak to your NCO officers. You know, that's the first step. And then we'll make sure that, you know, we, we set up locations you know, we already have locations set up where they're supposed to go and, and you know, do their uh, visits. Um, but, you know, we can add more locations to those uh, uh, on their assignments when they are on patrol. Thank you very much. Now, um, it may be too late to get any um, added to the list, but if you had um, any capital or expense priorities that you would like Community Board to, to um, help you prioritize and put on our list so that you can more easily get funding, um, what would they be? I mean, first of all, I, I think the uh, one everyone probably demands is, you know, if we get some uh, cameras, you know, at certain locations, um, you know, which will help, you know, one, deter crime, and then, of course, you know, uh, catch the individuals, you know, that do commit the crime, you know, uh, that'd be obviously the first you know, priority would be in certain locations. You know, there are a lot of cameras, you know, um, throughout the, the 84 precinct uh, jurisdiction, but, you know, again, most of them are like private, and then, you know, we have to wait for subpoenas uh, and other issues that come with it. I think we have cameras on uh, Fulton Street on our list, but that is, uh, yeah. it's good to know that um, that is a top priority that's consistent with yours. Yeah, okay, thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. You too. All right, thanks everybody for participating in that. Um, I would like to take a step backwards, if I may, to um, close out our Brooklyn Bridge Forest uh, presentation with a motion on that. 
maybe Carol Ann or Rob, you could speak to us about what they may um, be seeking from us. Is it a, a, a letter and to whom would it be addressed? Well, um, you know, when you ask what they would like to see, they um, they did get a resolution from Community Board 1 in Manhattan, and I shared that uh, with you and Cheryl and uh, Carol Ann earlier today um, without going into all the whereas um, 40 in favor, none opposed, three abstentions. Um, and so I think they would be uh, very happy to uh, receive a similar endorsement from Brooklyn Community Board too, but um, you know, you are your own committee and your own board. You should um, respond as the the sentiment and process seems appropriate. Thank you, Rob. Is there a motion that somebody would like to put forth? I, I'd like to make a motion to yes, support their, the uh, plan that they presented. Uh, that that limit but but I would like to clear that we're limiting it to one lane in each direction. We're not calling for the closing of the Brooklyn Bridge like they've done in some other areas. So I think it's clear that, that we support, you know, the multi-users of the Brooklyn Bridge. That includes the bicyclists and pedestrians and uh, and cars. And so I would make a motion that we support the proposal as presented and I'll leave it at that. Is there a second? Is there a second? Uh, is mine how I ask? I second. Brian, did you second it? Yes. Okay, Brian seconds. Um, I'm, I'm instead of doing all in favor, I'm going to do um, anyone opposed. Oh, can I? Oh, sorry. sorry. So, Discussion. Sure. I just want to point out that um, we also um, <clears throat> passed a resolution calling for a lane in each direction on the Brooklyn Bridge a couple of months ago. Um, we can keep it in. I just want to point out that we recently did ask for that as well. But can I say, do I understand your motion? Your motion, he was talking about this phase, well, not he, um, uh, Scott was talking about his phase zero. And his phase zero is simply the one, the um, ramp on the north, the outside north lane, Manhattan down. And you, I wasn't sure that in what you were saying, you were talking about two lanes. Yeah, you one were talking about both the out, the Brook, the Manhattan bound north lane and the Brooklyn bound north lane, which would be the inner lane on the Brooklyn, Brooklyn bound side. Well, I thought the proposal, frankly, was both lanes. I thought, I, I mean, the, the, I, I can't hear you. So, you Sid, uh, it, it is, it, it did include both lanes as a phase. A second phase. The first phase was just the outermost lane of the north side of the bridge. Should we just simplify it and say approved as presented? Well, but I wasn't sure what was, what, what, but are we saying what was presented was, I thought, just the phase zero and everything else was prospective, unfunded, and um, I, I, it wasn't just phase zero. The other parts were in the presentation too. Well, there was yeah, but there was no there was no detail on on the rest of it. And does that include um, uh, planking the you know the the out the uh, the platform over the traffic that he showed in the plan? Well, and I guess what's the, I guess I should ask the question and Rob mentioned it. What exactly was the motion of CB1 in Manhattan? What was their language? Uh, you have to give me a second, John. Okay. So Julia, I guess the well, question he's... is, are you uh, supporting only the first phase or um, the presentation? Is that a question to me? Or, or me? Sorry, to Sid. Sorry, well, John. Sorry, I'm supporting, I'm Sid, supporting yeah. one, one lane in each direction and the planking, frankly. I think that the, both of the, that, that that's a, 
uh, and that that is a very pro pedestrian bicyclist, and it leads two lanes of traffic uh, remaining for the cars. I think okay, that's, that's all I wanted to. I sort of well, I would like to know what CB one did, but certainly now I understand Sid's motion, which is the entire proposal that was in the PowerPoint, which included taking away, which as Brian pointed out, we've already supported taking away one lane of vehicular traffic on each side in each direction. I don't think we did any, we, we were talking then about moving bikes off of giving, bike, giving bikes more exclusive space by taking a lane in each direction that's now vehicular on the Brooklyn Bridge. And I think it included taking a lane on the lower level of the Manhattan Bridge to be exclusively bikes, if I remember our resolution. It does, frankly, it does. And I, you know, I'm so I'm so supportive of that as well, but I think what's right in front of us right now is the Brooklyn Bridge. Are there, is there, so, um, John, Quint, can you restate the motion as you understand it? Yeah, as I understand it, it's to support the uh, Brooklyn Bridge Forest Bridge, including the, the dedication of what they call, including the dedication of two present vehicular lanes, one in each direction for exclusive use of two wheeled vehicles, because he talked about motorized and pedaled bikes and the extension of but you know his, if, if you looked at that well i because i'm going to have a comment on that and the um additional extension of the walkway by building a deck above the present vehicular lanes on the bridge is that is that a fair statement of your motion yes all right, but now, if you remember, because we never talked about it, but his expand the Brooklyn uh, the Bridge Forest showed that on the upper level, he liked to call it the upper level, the present pedestrian level, the expansion included the inclusion of a, of a further dual lane bike path. No, I don't believe so. Yes, you... yes, that is that is accurate because he had proposed that the bike lanes in the roadbed of the bridge were an interim first measure. Um, I had questioned him about the landmarks issues, um, about having the bike lanes on the upper deck, the promenade um, painted, et cetera. And he had indicated flexibility of working with landmarks to either keep them down uh, in the interim location or potentially to move them up or to have both where one becomes a speedway and the other one becomes more of a slow meandering bike path. Uh, no, I didn't hear him say, he, he's taking bikes totally off of that upper level. Bikes no, are no, no, Cheryl, he had, if you looked at his, his PowerPoint, it showed on that on one side, it was decking for, and that was on the south side, there was decking so that people could get closer to the Statue of Liberty and have a better view to the south. But there was decking on the north side, and that was to provide, because it was green with a divider line down it, for further bike lanes. Why don't we just do that. support the uh, interim portion of his presentation since he didn't fully explain and develop the. the long yeah, that's what I said. And, and I would be more happy in supporting his phase zero. Yeah. Because that's what he has funding for, and that's what he has engineering for. But I don't think he has anything beyond that for anything beyond the the points he labeled as phase zero. Yeah, but I, I also Excuse like me, Juliet. Would you like to see that slide again? Because it's on their website. Thank you. Yes, Carolyn. Could you share your screen? Uh, give me a sec. Sid, are you open to that? No, I would like to. I would like to add that we would also support removing the bikes from the pedestrian pathway completely. I mean, and I just, I just see that as whether they're slow, fast, or whatever, 
in, the safest thing is to remove them completely. In, in the longer term plan, they are separate. They are not. They are not commingled with the. Um, the but the there's another way. slide where he shows the. Well, even that shows. I think it shows someone standing on a bike there. It shows oh. someone on the upper level, on the north side, of a bike. There's a bike lane there. Okay, I'm not seeing. So, Sid, how about let's just support his 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 phase zero phase zero plan? Yeah, where yeah, the bike lanes are relocated to the red bed. Moving bikes from the upper level. Right. Yeah. Can we talk about equity for a minute? Because I I don't know what the Manhattan CB one group agreed to, um, but given that. You know, they've spent uh, so long against infill on the Smith houses, right? Um, it, it seems kind of strange that we would allow a developer, potentially the developer of Smith houses, to uh, be a title sponsor in this and add to. Um, that don't allow us to get where we need to go. Um, and so I, I support this, but I'm very apprehensive if it includes private funding. So he didn't really explain it, but his website did, and I checked it out beforehand. Um, the sponsors basically get a logo on a plank of wood that goes on the bridge. That's what they get. In this environment of, you know, I, maybe a statement can be added, um, but this is up to Sid, um, about concern about the, you know, give, given his um, prioritization of the environment, that we would also want to prioritize equity um, in consideration of who the sponsors are, something like that. I, I have no problem with that, and, and and I frankly think we should support city funding so you don't get involved in who gets planks. You are You're a right. motion maker, Sid. So, so I, I would agree that we should put in something about equity, and that that we also support the city funding funding this project. Great, yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing the the black. They've got four and a half million dollars for the BQX that they don't need, so that they. Can and two and a half million for this. Um, can I say something? Can you hear me? Yes, Sandy. I, I have a problem with developers, um, and this is very vague. Um, we were just in a situation with an event we're doing this weekend to that a developer, somebody reached out to a developer that we fought for a year on ULERP. Um, and and the developer overthrew our, our our zoning that protected our community from um towers next to low rise buildings i i just have a problem with developers and it was too vague i i don't really want to sandy i i changed it to, we support city funding so it takes the developers out of it completely yeah All right, and uh, Brian, you're still good with your second? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Thank Let's you. put it to a vote. And then rather than saying all in favor, I'm going to say anyone opposed? Does anyone abstain? Fantastic. So unanimously approved. Thank you very much. I, um, in the, uh, I'm going to move on. Um, for chair's report, uh, I had intended to work with you to prioritize our um, budget priorities, but it was too late. Um, if you'll check your email, Taya has already emailed you the budget priorities for everybody to vote on. And um, I believe the executive committee will meet before they are due. Um, the community board will only be able to submit 30 budget priorities, I believe. 
and I think that is for uh, one of the categories. Um, and maybe Caroline, you can tell, uh, uh, be more specific about um, the number for the other category. Or Rob. Oh, so. um, it's 25 in each category. Okay. But I remember it being traditionally. Okay. 25 capital, 25 expense. So um, not all of ours are gonna get in, but um, I think we, we did a good exercise to um, really think through these. Um, and also to let people know, um, the MTA slash New York City Transit um, priorities were taken out off last year because that is not a city agency and they hadn't been responsive to us having um, the various stations um, such as York Street Station um, on the list of priorities. And so they were removed last year, so they are still not on this year. Actually, yeah. Juliet, I was instructed to add them back. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so you were um, able to get them on. Okay, great. I, I added the York Street priority as well as, of, of course, the accessibility issue. Okay, great. Thanks, Caroline. I'm glad that you were able to get them on. So um, it will be good for, um, I think, elected officials to be aware of those priorities, even if they are not able to be funded directly by the MTA. Um, I have no other items in my chair's report, unless Cheryl would like to share anything um, about the precinct council meeting. No precinct council meeting because um, our members are older and we don't want to have in-person meetings. Right. So right. hopefully, I think November we're trying to do a Zoom. The NYPD is trying to set up a Zoom meeting. Uh, uh, unless we can do Zoom meetings, there will be no meetings because I do not want to have people in the room. That makes sense. That's with it. And it's getting colder. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I would like to open it up to other business, which is the um, the section for the community board, uh, board and committee members to uh, propose other business. And I, I, I know, John, too, you had um, some. And then after that will be community forum where, Victoria, if you're still on, you can talk about the um, statues of Columbus. Okay, so um, other business. Um, yep. I I'll wait for John if he's still here, but I also had something when he's done. You know, we're not hearing him, and I can't tell who's on the phone. So Brian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, in our June meeting, we. Um, uh, looked at a bunch of presentations for DOT for um, protected bike lanes. One of them was to uh, put, uh, to install a protected bike lane on the east side of Navy Street between Flushing and Sands, um, as opposed to the two on-street bike lanes. And um, I brought up um, that currently the, the the Greenway, as being constructed by DDC, narrows um, just east of the Wegmans and remains narrow until uh, right before flushing. Um, and I believe you mentioned to me that that temporary. Um, and I spoke to Terry Carta of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway Initiative, uh, who mentioned that yes, indeed, that is temporary, but temporary meaning two to three years. Um, and so this is potentially a a like two block detour where you're forcing people to cross flushing and back. Um, and I just wanted to update the, the community. I don't know that that's correct. Um, we're working with DDC uh, in my professional capacity. We're working with DDC and they had plans to rip up flushing. Um, the sidewalk on flushing in front of Wegmans um, in the near future. We are, we are just working out the grades with them. Um, as we speak and came up with a detail that uh, um, was pretty well worked out. So their contractors are already um, ready to go. So I'm not, I'm not sure about the area that you're talking about being a two year lead time. Um, I did hear from community board 
uh, to district office that the um, area that we heard in our presentation in June from uh, Flushing to Sands, Navy Street won't be until 2021. But I believe the Flushing uh, Avenue part in front of Wegmans and then to uh, Navy Street is in process, basically. There's construction now between, I believe, Cumberland um, to just east of the Wegmans, and that's all been torn up. Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to that section or from. That's the same contractor that is engaged and responsible to Navy. Okay, I'm um, just passing along what Terry Carter said, um, but I'll defer to you since you are working on the project. I mean, I'm not. Or you I'm are only Jason. working with DDC, so yeah. you know, <laughs> DDC is working on the project. I would hope that it is not a two-year project, and it is not what I had um, been informed. Thank you. Okay. Any other um, business before community forum? Um, can I just say something? You see me, Julia? We hear you, Sandy. We hear you. Oh, okay. So um, I don't know. Uh, DOT was meeting with the with um, a group of people from the from Brooklyn Heights specifically about the North Heights. They want to close. Um, they they want to do work over there and and have cars not exit. I think it's exit 28 to Cadman Plaza, but instead exit on Atlantic Avenue because of the work they're doing. And um, I and I initially wasn't in, well. I wasn't invited, and I uh, somebody said. Uh, called me to see why, you know, nobody from Atlantic Avenue was part of this. Um, so I emailed and uh, anyway, um, the DOT feels that there aren't, um, the, there's not the volume to create traffic at, at Atlantic Avenue because they have to get off at the Atlantic Avenue exit, go, uh, make a, a left and go down Furman Street into Fulton Landing. So I just, because it's very late. Um, so DOT uh, assured that they will continue to monitor the traffic along Atlantic Avenue and the Atlantic Avenue interchange during the construction period. So I don't know, you know, we have to see how can I uh, can I jump in here for just a quick moment? Um, I have uh, I've been doing a couple of things like counting cars at the corner of Hicks and Poplar, you know, right at the end of of right near the construction site. Uh, I've just done it like like ten times, and then also measuring a noise level. Um, and noise level is one thing, you know, that's a, another issue. But but in terms of the cars, it is it really is not an issue. I must say They're, they are right. It's uh, it just hasn't changed that much, um, you know, in the sample that I've done. Uh, and I and I and I I'm walking around there a fair amount, so. Um, but hopefully they'll continue monitoring it. Yeah. I, well, I just want to say that um, Atlantic Avenue at that interchange with Hicks, um, you know, it, it, it's it's prone to traffic jams and Hicks Street um south of Atlantic uh doesn't have any capacity it, it it can just sit there and they have very complicated um turning uh conflicts so so, so what I would suggest I'm, ju I'm just saying I'm just saying that um even though they're saying there's uh, not that much traffic it's already a, a difficult location so we have to see, and they and they said they would monitor it, and so we'll see. I just wanted to bring it up. So so thank you for bringing it up, and it reminds me um, to get back to John Dew's initial uh, comment in the beginning of the meeting that I agree with. Um, I I think that we should, as a committee, put together our list of DOT issues as we do on a year, as we have done on a yearly basis, 
um, I can circulate um, by email the list that uh, we had been working on, and then let's update it to get those issues on there um, so that we can forward that to DOT in advance and then invite them to a meeting uh, again to address those issues. Um, we did have, um, I believe it was Diana Soriano do it last time uh, for us, um, and it's, it helped to have the, the questions in advance, um, I believe. Um, so issues like that, but a lot of us have those kind of issues. So, so let's, let's send a document around and then, um, maybe Carol Ann, would you be willing to take, take and consolidate people's, um, um, sort of study, study, uh, areas, study questions. How about, um, we do a Google doc so everyone can enter directly into the document. Okay, I don't know how to do Google Docs though. So is, I'll is some, can somebody volunteer to do that? I'll set it up and then everyone will just enter it. Okay, that sounds great. And I will pop you, once you send me the link, I will cut and paste what I have in there from uh, the uh, previous meetings. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Carol Ann. You're welcome. Um, I would like to open it up now to community forum. And the first person I would like to invite is Victoria because she emailed me um, about uh, these statues uh, before the meeting. Thank you everyone for your patience and letting me speak again. Um, so our group was mostly concerned with, um, our, our main goal is to have the statues removed, but we're also just concerned with how much it was costing um, the taxpayer and the, and the borough to, you know, if we already know the salary of a police officer is between forty and eighty-five thousand dollars, you know, we can safely assume that it's anywhere between fourteen thousand and twenty-eight thousand a month just to have one officer surveil a statue. Um, and I'm sure that's not how Captain Rana wants to spend his um, his department's resources. I'm sure that's not how the community wants to have their resources spent. Um, and just knowing that it hasn't fostered the best relationship between the community and the police department when they're interacting um, in in that way, when they're peacefully protesting and they're kind of getting confronted with, you know, four to 10 police cars. Um, so I want to know if, you know, this is kind of our first try at engaging um, our local officials. So I thought, um, you know, transportation and public safety, this would be a ripe um, concern for this committee and I just wanted to know um, what could be done. I think the ideal situation would be to remove the statues, then the police officers could go on to help, you know, stop gun violence and gang violence. Um, and it would be a win-win for everyone. But I wanted to know if the committee would be supportive of advocating for the removal of statues and be helpful in that process, navigating that process. So Victoria, uh, I thank you for bringing this to our attention in the realm of discussion of, um, you know, the NYPD budget and, and resource allocation. Um, I think if the goal is the removal of the statues, it may be best to present your argument um, to, uh, to the Youth Education and Cultural Affairs Committee of Community Board 2. Um, and um, maybe with more of the um, the background knowledge about why um, it is inappropriate to have a statue of Columbus. You know, we renamed Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day. Why do we continue to have the statues? Um, I think that we, our committee, could support it from a budgetary perspective, a you know inefficient use of resources, an over escalated, um, forceful response to peaceful protesting. But I think that if the fundamental goal is remove the statues, I think it should be an initiative. And I just thought of this. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. I should have suggested this earlier. Um, initiative that is um, taken the lead by uh, uh, from the the Yaka committee. Okay. And what would that support look like? Would that be in like a letter or a statement to that committee directly once I speak to them, or how would I gain the transportation and public um, safety committee support? once I bring it to Yaka? It would be a community board um, level support so that after Yaka hears it and takes it uh, um, over, if they if they decide to do so, then um, I would support it from, um, from our perspective, but then it would be a community um, board or executive committee vote to support something like that. 
Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. Would the district office like to add anything to that? It may also include the parks department as well. So the parks and recreation committee, because for instance, this, this statue is in Columbus Park. So it's, it's on their property. Do you I think, think you'll like the process for them to address? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't get everything you said, Juliet. Do you think that would be a better committee for them to address than the parks committee? Well, it depends on where we have um, where we where the statues are located. But if we're just speaking of the Columbus um, statue, then probably the Parks Committee because it's their statue. Okay, and I, I know Victoria, you have an educational background. Your your uh, goal is educational, um, so uh, maybe some more. Um, of a presentation might be helpful when you do bring it up to the Parks Committee. Okay, that's a good idea, thank you. Thank you. Could I propose a motion, um, which would be the same way we do studies for the Department of Transportation to do a study um, of the YPD um, regarding this matter and regard uh, protecting statues rather than people. Uh, you can propose that. I, I would prefer I that she go I the other route. put it that way. Okay, yeah. I mean, I don't see why both couldn't help. Um, okay, is there a second to? It wouldn't, uh, let me rephrase. Um, motion to study NYPD costs uh, related to patrolling Columbus Park. Who would be doing and who, and who would be doing this study? Who, who would get that information? How would this committee be able to determine how much it costs to go to these statues? Uh, OMB, NYPD, CCRB. Uh, you know, all of these groups work together when they have to, or when you foil something. Yeah, it's interesting. I have a point of this. Of, 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 we really shouldn't be doing things like this without having it on the agenda, so people, at least the community, knows what we're thinking about. So I would really ask if it's going to anything's going to happen with this, that is, there not be a vote on this, that it be tabled and put on the agenda for next week, for next month. So that people have noticed and that we just don't do something without getting some public comment from notice to the public about what we're thinking of. That is an excellent point, Sid. Excellent. So, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I was just uh, trying to give Victoria and her group of um, educators uh, another option, but because they'll both take the same amount of time, I, I, I think the other um, committees would be better. It's also and, and board thank chair. you, thank you both of you. Um, and given uh, Victoria, given Sid's um, suggestion, um, I I think that you should try to get on the public agenda of whichever of those co two committees um, uh, would find it appropriate, um, so that the public would be notified of of uh, your initiative. Is Victoria still on? Yes, so thank you, I wrote that down. So will this be on the public agenda for next month's meeting or, or no? Not of this committee, but when you do the outreach, you can, uh, via the district office probably, um, to the two other committees, you can figure out which one of them uh, would uh, be willing to host you. Okay. Victoria, if you're able to check the chat feature in WebEx, I've sent you some information. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Tia. Is there any other uh, community forum? Great. Um, hearing none, I think that was the last agenda item. Am I wrong? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. <laughs> oh, no, I'm wrong. Approval of the minutes before you before you move to adjourn. Any any problems with the minutes? John, they're always excellent. Thank you very much for taking them. And now, Sid. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, all. everybody.
Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Sandy. Happy birthday, Sandy. Happy birthday, Sandy.